much. Without further ado, debaters, are you ready? Absolutely. Judges, are you ready? Absolutely. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? And let's get ready to rumble. We will now call on Kevin Illiman, Prime Minister. The resolution, Prime Minister, is the government surveillance is justified. Please begin now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in this honored house to speak about an issue that is at the forefront of the conversation in society today. And that issue is public safety. We're talking about a transparent program and project that involves multiple levels of government so that society can achieve its goal of ensuring public safety. That includes municipal levels, that includes provincial levels of government, and surveillance tools can range, again, my colleague will go into greater detail about the specifics, but surveillance tools can range from things like cameras out in public parks, cameras in metro that currently already exist in places like the London Underground, where there's something in a neighborhood of 6,000 of them, so this is what we're talking about when we're talking about government surveillance. These tools, which are responsibly used, which are often in the requirement of a warrant to use in order to achieve public safety. And I emphasize the fact that it is entirely possible for us to use these tools responsibly and this government is committed to con continue doing as such. To think with me here. When I th because when I think of places like Copenhagen, when I think of places like Brussels, when I think of places perhaps like Paris, Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, perhaps you might be thinking that listing cities which belong to some of the freest and greatest democracies in the world. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, what I'm actually listing off is a list of places which have experienced recent and very violent uh, acts of terror and other dangerous acts recently. The government understands the reality that we face and we understand the expectations of citizens around the world to ensure public safety as a number one priority. We are prepared to engage with the public, to make sure they are educated, to make sure that they understand that we are building a project and a program, we are building a safer world, we are building a safer community, Mr. Speaker. If I may again reiterate in the last closing seconds of my opening speech, government surveillance is justified because we are achieving public safety. It works, it will continue to work, and we will find ways to adapt responsibly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. I will now call on the Leader of the Opposition, Lawrence Watt, to rebut. Government surveillance is justified. We heard a lot about safety and uh, the surge in technological capabilities and combating terrorism. Um, we're going to systematically go through those arguments. We're going to prove to you all why the government is wrong. We're going to talk <coughs> even more about why surveillance is unjustified, and we're going to conclude. Indeed, I agree full-heartedly with the government. We do live in a dangerous world. We do. <laughs> We do live in a world where there is rapidly increasing technology, where there is ISIS, where there is Rob Ford. <laughs> <laughs> but I assure you, Mr. Speaker, government surveillance is not the way to keep us safe, and it is certainly not the way to combat terrorism. There are better ways we can ensure safety without sacrificing our charter and rights and freedoms. It's very dangerous to allow a government to have this type of surveillance. For instance, who watches the watchers? The Canadian Security Intelligence Service of Canada used to have an Office of Inspector General that provided oversight, but no longer we have that. The office was shut down in 2012, meaning that we don't have a high-level body of elected officials providing oversight. Who watches the watchers? We heard the government talk about transparency and responsibility. I, I thought he was joking, but I refrained from laughing. <laughs> Let, let's look at transparency. The government really feels that they can provide transparency. It's, it's not the case. When Edward Snowden came out and provided really good information, doing what a true patriot would, the government has gone out of its way in all, in all ways possible to try and convict him, to try and have him tried in a FISA court, which is essentially a kangaroo court, 
So whistleblowing and finding out the truth is actually, it's infringed upon. Mr. Speaker, ultimately, government surveillance is unpopular, ineffective, illegal, subject to abuse, and counterproductive both to reducing threats and enhancing a democratic society. All of these reasons make surveillance unjustified. I argue, let's spend our tax money on systems that don't survey us, and don't suspect us of criminal behavior. Let's spend our tax money on producing a society where we recognize there are real threats in the world, but there are always alternatives to assuring we can create a good society, a safe society, where our liberties are protected without sacrificing our charter on rights and freedoms. Our constitution works, our courts works, and our rights are not for sale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I will now call on Deputy Prime Minister Ida LaBelle, eight minutes in response to that spirited rhetoric. This government is prepared to introduce things into the legislation, such as sunset clauses, where after 10 years uh, the bill is brought back into Parliament and redebated. We would like to mention that there are things, uh, regulatory practices, such as the Supreme Court, which you failed to understand, um, and judicial approval of warrants. These all restrict access to info, information that is gathered by the government to restrict the abuse of power. Thank you for your concern, opposition, but your paranoia is not based in logic. Might I suggest a psychiatrist? Let me pose a question to the House, Mr. Speaker. What is more important to you, ladies and gentlemen? Your text messages and your emails? Or your life? How about your children's lives? The opposition will have you believe that you are already safe, that there's nothing to worry about, that we've got this under control. However, this type of comfortable thinking is a luxury of Canada. We are known internationally for our safe environment. And conveniently enough, we are already operating on a pre-existing level of government surveillance. Funnily enough, the opposition has neglected to mention that their privilege to speak against the government is all because we live in a free, safe society where their dissent is tolerated. Government surveillance is preventative, not offensive. Let me pose another question to the House, Mr. Speaker. What type of society would you like to live in? The opposition asked the same question, gave you the wrong options. We, as the government, would prefer a secure society, not a secretive one, where people are always suspicious of everyone else, where mothers are unsure of the safe return of their children, where fathers are unsure of their safe return to their families. The federal government is charged with the responsibility of keeping Canadians safe, and that is what we're here to do, Mr. Speaker. We would like to keep Canadians safe with a proactive security system, rather than wait for an inevitable attack from an increasingly violent world that can jeopardize the lives of our citizens. The government is blamed, Mr. Speaker, on every turn, when someone dies in an act of terror, the government is asked, why didn't you stop this? When the government tries to enact legislature to ensure that it will never happen again, people, like in the paranoid opposition, will blame the government for infringing on our rights and freedoms. We can have both, Mr. Speaker. We need to find a balance between private, privacy and collective security, which is what the government is proposing we do today. Terrorists and criminals are fully capable of attacking our citizens. They have proved this. And we as the government believe that it is good, it is reasonable, it is legitimate. Mr. Speaker, it is justified 100% that we deter these terrorists and criminals from harming our people. Criminals and terrorists have proven that they are not scared, that they are not afraid to attack us. We must meet them with the same fearlessness strong, secure, Canadian, and collectively dedicated to protecting our freedom. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would now like to call on the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, uh, Dick
Dixon and Sunthrum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've just listened to eight minutes of complete and utter delusion. I'm going to keep it short, sharp, and sweet. So now let's look at the facts. Surveillance equals power. Because knowledge equals power. And surveillance gets you more knowledge. The more you know about someone, the more you can manipulate them, bend them to your will by pure coercion. So to go on to my first point, I'm going to talk about the judicial consequences as addressed by the Deputy, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister. I'm going to compare this judicial process that she loves to fall back on to FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of the United States of America. It's supposed to provide democratic oversight, but there have been no requests for surveillance that have been denied. And there's a very good reason. There is no one to speak out in opposition, no one to give a modicum of an argument against any sort of surveillance. And these independent judiciaries are not elected, they're chosen, chosen by this despicable government. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the solution that the leader of the opposition hinted upon. It's a very unique solution. It's that of education. I know you might be a little confused. Why education? Education of our civil rights and liberties. Why is that important? The importance is that once an individual fully understands the sanctity of your community, each individual citizen alone has the impetus to jealously guard that community. That is our ultimate defense against security and terror threats. Last month, we had a tragic occurrence. Actually, it was not a tragic occurrence. It's a good thing. In Toronto, two individuals got arrested in charges of terrorism. They were conspiring to commit the act of terror, but it's interesting to note the circumstances in which they were caught. An imam or priest within their community saw that these two individuals were getting too radical and were posing a threat to his community. He alerted the authorities, who investigated using traditional methods and investigative techniques, and prevented a sad, sad occurrence. In conclusion, it is the right of the PM to surrender his intrinsic worth to anyone, even the Deputy Prime Minister, for scrutiny. 30 seconds. Thank you, Speaker. But he cannot speak for everyone. If there is one detractor, one opponent to your view, you must let him speak, have his say, and stop surveillance in its entirety. There is no feasible way to appropriate one standard for one person and judge another by a completely different standard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now enter a very interesting time of open debate. Now, Mr. Speaker, if I may, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, he made a uh, very interesting statement. He tried to equate that knowledge is power, of course, a traditional cliché. He was claiming that the more knowledge you have, the more power you have, and therefore the more manipulative you can be. Well, I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition opposite me has acquired a lot of knowledge upon his education and upon his career endeavors. Uh, I would like to caution the House that if what he's saying is right, then perhaps he's manipulating all of us. I'm not sure if he can trust his word, if that's the case. <laughs> Lastly, Mr. Speaker, the Opposition is going to do, have to do a lot better. Section 1 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms addresses specifically what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was aiming at when he was talking about necessary and proportionate measures in order to violate privacy. We have a well-functioning judicial system. We have the systems in place. We do have oversight. We are able to make sure that surveillance is conducted responsibly, transparently. The government's going to have to do a much better job, Mr. Speaker, of using their arguments because it's certainly not flying here. It's not going to fly with seconds. the people. And they haven't found a way to keep people safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Two minutes. Oh dear, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> this government is justifying totalitarianism, and there's a quick way to make this test. All of you in this room, I'm sure, have a cell phone. This government, how many of you would feel safe of just giving them your phones and giving them your passwords? I don't think any of you would. And, and fairly enough, I don't blame you, because I wouldn't either. Now, there was a point, there was a point brought up before, and it was talking about um, the soldier who was killed, a tragic event. But the question that I want to ask is this. Considering that Canada has suffered two terrorist attacks since 9-11, 
and considering that there have been numerous terror attacks thwarted through lawful policing without the use of mass surveillance, that my question to the government is, how many crimes are you willing to commit to prevent one or two crimes? How many crimes are you willing to commit to invade our privacy, to deprive us of our inherent charter guaranteed rights? How many are you willing to trample on to stop one or two deaths? The truth is, our armed forces, they are here to protect our freedom, to protect our rights and freedoms. And I personally believe soldiers would be ashamed, as well as our grandparents who died fighting for the rights and freedoms we have today, they would be ashamed of what we are putting up with, quite frankly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. for you here, which they are trying to skirt. The um, leader of the opposition mentioned a totalitarian state, which is, I mean, beyond what we are speaking here, Mr. Speaker. We have regulations in place, such as sunset clauses, that particularly are used to avoid this type of abuse of power. But that aside, if the opposition had their way, we would live in a country with absolutely no surveillance. Imagine getting onto an airplane where anybody's allowed to bring a gun or a knife. Hey, you're a dangerous citizen? That's okay. Come on into our country. We don't mind. We've got nothing to stop you. How illogical does this sound to you, Mr. Speaker? I wouldn't want to live in a country where my safety, my children's safety, my neighbor's safety are threatened by people I don't even know. One thing that the uh, leader of the opposition brought up in his speech was uh, that we should resort to private information gathering rather than public. We agree to the terms and conditions of private companies every day. I'm sure some of you without reading them, that's okay. But we agree to them anyway. Yet as soon as it comes uh, to the table to confide, confide in a regulated government that you elected democratically, the world ends in conspiracy. Set your priorities straight, ladies and gentlemen. Who would you rather have access to that information? A private business that operates for a profit and could sell your information? Or a government that is regulated by judicial systems such as the Supreme Court of Canada and has a legal obligation to uphold your safety? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Deputy Leader of the Opposition, please take your two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister seems to appeal to Section 1 of the Charter in order to justify his violation of Art Section 8. The, um, the, the security of rights of freedom for everyone is the right to be secure and against unreasonable search and seizure. This inherently is kind of worrying in the fact that he's proposing legislation and policy that would detract from an institutionally chartered guaranteed right and freedom. Surveillance. Mr. Speaker, does not prevent harm. The National Security Agency in America, the largest agency of its kind, says that of all the data that it sifts through, a percent of a percent is red flagged. Red flagged, it doesn't result in the prevention of a, some sort of terror conspiracy. We believe that the battle that you are waging for security is actually waged in the hearts and minds of individual citizens of this world, not just Canadians. And that's where our solution triumphs yours. It has the benefits without the problems associated with your solution. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We will now have the uh, two final closing statements, uh, beginning with three minutes from the Leader of the Opposition, Lawrence Watt. Please go ahead, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we do live in a dangerous world, and yes, there are great threats, but we've always been under threat. We were under threat in World War II with an expanding totalitarian state. We were under threat during the Cuban Missile Crisis when there was the threat of nuclear fallout, and we are under threat today. However, what kept us going in the past was that we were fueled. We were fueled by a fight for the rights and freedoms. It was the Allies fighting for a democratic society where rights to privacy were cherished against the authoritarian regimes of fascism and communism which had no respect for privacy whatsoever. The questions that I want to propose to the government today are how many crimes are they willing to commit to prevent one or two deaths when it's already been proven that we can prevent terror attacks without the use of mass surveillance? 
If you want to prevent all crimes, you can probably do this with a full surveillance state, where you have a camera in every bedroom to prevent wife beating, a camera on every street, and a microphone in every laptop. It's found out today that the Communication Security Establishment of Canada collects upwards of 15 million uploads of records and downloads every day, and I believe there is no way it is justified. It is unpopular. It is legally controversial. And ultimately, there is no way it could be endorsed in a democratic society. For government surveillance is a disgusting procedure for a professed free society. The real crime here is on the Canadian people. As free citizens, we should be able to walk the street without feeling watched. All of us in this room, I would wager, are law-abiding citizens. We don't need, and most importantly, we don't deserve this level of surveillance. It is completely unconstitutional and it is unwarranted. In concluding, Mr. Speaker, the government has argued it can keep people safe. The government has argued it is necessary and come in with the surge of technology. But no, if we invest in education, if we focus on community initiatives, we can solve these problems without jeopardizing our rights. We can solve these problems through participation, through understanding, through sharing knowledge, not collecting knowledge and hiding it away so we don't know. We have a right to know the grounds on which we're being detained. We have the right to know the knowledge that is being taken from us, and we would not have this knowledge if it was not for Edward Snowden re re releasing all of this years ago. And as already mentioned, this, all this talk about responsibility and transparency, just look at the way he's been treated. There is no transparency. Whistleblowers are taught like, taught, uh, treated like criminals, and that's because truth becomes treason in an empire of lies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to withdraw the balance of my time. The opposition posed a question, what kind of society do we want to live in? Mr. Speaker, I personally do not want to live in a society, and I know many Canadians who have elected this strong government agree. I do not want to live in a society where the public administration's hands are tied from being able to protect the lives of the people, from being able to ensure public safety. Once again, echoing what the opposition said, we have been under threat from before. We are currently under threat, and we will in the future continue to be under threat. We have had surveillance programs in the past under different forms. We currently possess one in our society today. And what the government is proposing is that surveillance is justified, primarily because it is helping us ensure the safety of lives. Mr. Speaker, going forward, we are going to need to adapt to an evolving reality around us. Things, again, will not be the same in 50 years. What the government is proposing, we are proposing that we educate citizens, that we keep them involved in the discussion. That is how a transparent and responsible government functions, Mr. Speaker. And in the future, we are going to need to have that public dialogue and to be able to ensure the safety of our individuals in society. We are going to need these types of surveillance tools. We are doing this legitimately. We are doing this out of the expectation from the public for public safety, Mr. Speaker. Government surveillance is justified because it is saving lives and keeping people safe. Both safe in mind and safe in body. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much.